Welcome to Hard Talk, I'm Stephen Sacker. The international reach of the Black Lives Matter movement has put a new focus on racism in sport. My guest today is an athlete who made a stand. Adam Goods was a star in Aussie rules football, one of the greatest ever players of Aboriginal descent. He quit the game after years of racist abuse. A movie has been made of his story. What can Australia and the wider world learn from it? Adam Goods in New South Wales, welcome to Hard Talk. Thanks for having me, mate. Adam, you quit your sport, Aussie Rules Football, in 2015, having made a stand against racism. Five years on, racism and racism in sport is top of the agenda with the Black Lives Matter movement making it such a theme right across the world. How much do you believe has changed in the past five years? Um, I think the biggest thing that's changed for me is that I, you know, I'm not putting myself in a situation for that, um, you know, abuse to be put on me every time I went to work. So that's the biggest thing that's changed for me. And I'm incredibly more happier, um, you know, during that period. And, um, you know, I've definitely moved on from, from that part of my life. And I think if you think globally about what's changed, I think a lot more people are awoke now to, you know, racism, um, especially casual racism. That's the biggest, you know, thing about racism that I think people are learning about and um, having a little bit more empathy and, 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 and having a little bit more education about other people's race beliefs um, to, to be a little bit more tolerant of each other. You have made uh, a very moving documentary film, The Australian Dream, which portrays exactly what happened to you. And it, in many ways, is a very unhappy story. It shows your deep depression and unhappiness as you confronted the race issue. It also suggests a nation, Australia, that was deeply polarised by the issue. Has that changed? Um, it's hard to say. You know, I think um, you know, we want as many people across the world to see this documentary, and it isn't just a, um, a football documentary. This is a documentary about you know, the decisions and choices that I've made as an Indigenous person here in Australia, but it's also uh, a documentary about the history that's played a part in our country in the choices that I've made. You know, since colonisation of the British Empire some 200 odd years ago, um, you know, where they came and claimed our land as terra nullius and, you know, saying that there was no people living on this continent, um, which we obviously know was a lie. Um, and we're still not written into our constitution here in Australia. We're the only country part of the Commonwealth that hasn't got sovereignty with its first people. So there's lots of issues in this documentary that we talk to which have affected me on my journey and, and me finding my voice as a, as a strong Indigenous person. Interesting you say that, finding your voice. I, I want to take you right back to childhood. Uh, you were born of, a, of an indigenous uh, mum and a dad who was actually an immigrant, I believe, from, from Great Britain. Uh, you, I wonder, actually, whether you did, as a kid, identify as Aboriginal and whether that was a, a, an important part of your upbringing. Yeah, it's a little bit harder to identify with my British um, uh, ancestry with the colour of my skin. And, um, you know, for me, it was very clear that, you know, I didn't fit out, that I was a minority. And, um, you know, I was, I wore my colour of my skin as a badge of honour. And I knew that I was Aboriginal um, from a tribe called Ajnamatna, which means rock people from the Flinders Ranges in South Australia. Um, and, you know, my whole life was a journey about learning more about my culture and why I didn't grow up um, knowing, speaking that language um, and, and, the, and the regret that came with that as well. Were you bullied at school? I mean, were, were you uh, facing day-to-day -day, uh, discrimination and worse as a kid? 
Not, not every day. Um, I think what made it easier for me, you know, I went to six different primary schools, two different high schools, just as we moved around, as a lot of Indigenous families do to try and find their place. And um, our mum um, raised us three boys by herself. Um, and I think for me, you know, the bullying came and it obviously was directed at the colour of my skin. But, um, you know, I had some really good friends um, from different schools. And I think what made it a little bit easier to break down those barriers is that I could kick a ball, I could catch a ball, I could throw a ball, I could jump high, I could run fast. And, you know, those sort of attributes were made it easier for me to sort of fit in um, over time. I'm just very mindful that the guy you collaborated with the film Australian Dream uh, on, uh, Stan Grant, who, who wrote the film, is a big part of the film, he talked about as a young person growing up with uh, such a sense of shame. He, he said to be ab Aboriginal in my youth was to be ashamed, ashamed of our poverty, ashamed of the second hand clothes, the, the, the second hand sort of lifestyle, the broken glass, the constant movement. And yet you then became a standout athlete. How difficult was it to have a foot in both worlds? Uh, we still have a foot in both worlds, um, Steve. I think, you know, uh, most indigenous people live in two worlds. You know, the Western world and a, and a, and a culture, spiritual world of, um, you know, the indigenous ancestry that we have, which has a lot of trauma and baggage and um, hopelessness, disadvantage that's been passed on from generation to generation. So what we um, tend to do is, you know, create role models and be able to break down those barriers that I keep talking about for our future generations to understand that it does take hard work to be successful and you're going to have to work harder than non-Indigenous people if you want to be successful um, because of the barriers that might stand in your way. From the very late 90s through the 2000s, you became a, a, a really top talent. You played for the Sydney Swans. You won all sorts of personal and team awards and uh, cups and championships. And then came one extraordinary moment at the height of your career in 2013, which arguably changed your life. We've got a little clip of the film, which gives a sense of what happened. Let's just have a look at that right now. I just remember running down Collingwood's end and I grabbed the ball right near the boundary and I get pushed closer to the fence. And I hear from the crowd, Goods, you're an ape. Time just sort of stopped in my head. I was like, well. And I just turned around and I said to the security guard, I want her out of here. Now, when I looked at the person, I could see it was a kid. Is that a good sound going to somebody in the crowd, do you think? He definitely went back and pointed at someone in the crowd, something that was happening there. He's definitely not happy about something. Adam, that, that is an extraordinary moment. I'm just wondering, at what point did you realise that that horrible abuse that you had heard had come from a child? Yeah, so it's... You've got to sort of put this moment um, in time in a bit of context as well. So um, that week um, um, of the round where we were playing on the Friday night at the MCG was the start of Indigenous round, where we celebrate Indigenous people, players and culture over this weekend um, and the contribution that Indigenous people have made to the game. I also, during the week, um, did a... Um, um, a photograph emulating the great Nikki Winmar, who's in the documentary as well, because it was 20 year anniversary to the week um, when Nikki Winmar stood up in a game and lifted his shirt up at the end of it, pointing to his black skin, saying, I am black and I, and I am proud. Now, I did that um, and they printed that the morning of um, our game. Um, so this was a pretty big built-up game and, you know, we are playing against a team that I used to barrack for in Collingwood on the MCG and I just so happened to have a day out that, that game and it was late into the corner when that in quarter when that incident happened and it just absolutely could not believe it and by the time I'd turned around and pointed, um, you know, it was a young, young female and it wasn't until 
um, the security guard came over and I pointed that I walked away and the Collingwood teammate was actually, the Collingwood player who was right near me was Darren Jolly, who I'd won a premiership with at Sydney in 2005. Um, he came up to me, he goes, what's wrong, mate? I said, mate, she's 13 or 14 years old, I can't believe it. And he's like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And I just ran to the bench and, you know, I just couldn't believe that it was such a young person, um, you know, calling me an ape from the boundary line. There was uh, a huge amount of sympathy for you, but there was also, from more conservative Australians, a real backlash. Some accused you in the way that you uh, pointed at her, then the way that the security escorted her from the stadium, uh, and the way you spoke about it afterwards, talking about the, the face of racism in Australia. They said you, in essence, were unreasonably bullying a 13-year-old girl. Did you pause to consider whether they might have a point? I spoke to her after the game, her and her sister. Um, I had a really good conversation with them about what it was that they called me. She said, look, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that ape was a racial term. And um, it was good to have a conversation with her and her sister because, you know, to my point of this whole conversation was these girls don't know what they were saying. They were copying people in the crowd who obviously knew what they were saying by calling me um, an ape. And these young girls were just copying that. And that's the environment that these young girls are um, being educated in. So this, was a, all a, this whole conversation was about educating our young people, but educating people um, who do say those things in those public arenas that people are listening and people are observing and they're thinking that it's okay if you can say it, then I can say it as well. What's interesting in the documentary that you've just made, which reflects back on that incident, because it was a turning point in your life and maybe in the debate in Australia, it's interesting that you give a voice to conservatives who criticize you and who in essence say that you have been provocative in your career. You, for example, at one point after that, when you were being booed constantly by some of the fans in the stadiums, you did uh, what is an Aboriginal uh, sort of war dance uh, after scoring a goal. You, according to them, made matters worse and you allow their voices to be heard. Is that because you want to expose them? Do you feel those voices are themselves racist? Um, you work in the media, Steve. You know, these people are the people who work in the media who everyone has a voice and everyone deserves to have a voice. It's then about how do we make people accountable for that voice? And, you know, I just wanted to go out there and play the game. Now, when I did that Indigenous war cry, um, this was once again Indigenous round where we're supposed to be celebrating Indigenous people, Indigenous culture. And that round, I was wearing a, the Sydney Swan Guernsey, which was designed by my mother with Indigenous design on it. Um, so, you know, if that wasn't the moment to do an Indigenous war cry, being Indigenous round and I'm an Indigenous person with an Indigenous design Guernsey by my mother, um, I just don't know if Indigenous culture should ever be expressed on a football field. I want to think about the way in which sportsmen handle racist abuse today, because as you're probably aware in football, for example, soccer, I guess you might call it, uh, there are now protocols in international games, and we've seen it with England players, where if they are receiving racist abuse, and obviously we're talking about the black England players, then uh, a warning is put out across the stadium. If this continues, the game will cease. And we've actually seen it happen now in international matches where players have walked off the field because of racist abuse from the stands. Looking back, do you wish that you and your teammates had actually walked off the field when you experienced racist abuse? Oh, I don't think my teammates need to, um, you know, make such a big stance for me. If I can't, um, you know, create the, the type of action that needs to happen through me reporting that person post-game, them apologising to me, um, and then me um, actually taking that apology on, um, you know, there is a due process, but unfortunately here in Australia, what we're seeing now is social media is used as that tool to 
racially vilify our black players and athletes across our nation. And it is truly unfair. And these people use profiles that they just make up. And it's really hard to really um, capture who these people are. Um, you know, the ab abuse that, um, you know, racial abuse that I've had at football fields, I've always been able to see the person who did that. So I was able to point them out and report them and have a conversation with those those people on what it is and hold them accountable for what they, what they have said. Um, and unfortunately, when, you know, you have, you know, a majority of the arena booing you, it's really hard to... To, to really pinpoint those individuals who started or whether or not they're yeah. just booing me because I'm a, a shit bloke or because of my, um, you know, my race. But clearly in that period after 2013 through to 2015, it got to you to the point where, as I'm quoting something you, you, you said, uh, I, I felt like an absolute piece of, well, it's a word I can't repeat on TV. You say I was an emotional wreck. I didn't want to go to training. I felt like I'd never felt before in my entire career. I broke down. Uh, and then, of course, you literally walked away. You, you left Sydney and you went back to your ancestral homeland in the Flinders Mountains. But was it also a metaphorical walking away? I mean, in, in a sense, looking back on it, do you, do you feel that you were defeated? by walking away? No, I think um, in any person of colour and race that um, has ever been racially abused um, will understand how I was feeling during that period of time um, and they can really connect with it. And I suppose that's why the documentary is having um, so much success internationally is because a lot of people can connect to that feeling that I've been through and what they've been through in their life of being marginalised against. When you're in a dark place, it's like you've completely forgotten everything anybody ever said to you that was good. All that you think of are all the bad things that have ever happened to you. All you think about is all the bad things people have said to you. And it's on a stereo playing the loudest possible decibels in your head, echoing in your mind, you're worth nothing. I don't even care about you. Go away. To stand on a land and say, 2,000 generations of my family are from here. I'm born out of this place. That feeling is not something you can feel anywhere else. Me choosing to walk away was me making a choice for my own mental health and I needed to get away from this toxic environment which had up until that point in time been a safe place for me to just be um, an incredible player that I wanted to be and for me to you know, learn to, to be the leader that I was. But here I had a choice to submit myself to this toxic environment or to get away from it and, and really you know, reassess my priorities. And it was that trip away back to the Flinders Ranges that you know, help me realign what my purpose was and that this was going to be my last year and that I could get through the last six games of that season um, and, and, and be able to walk away from the game for good. What strikes me in this interview is that you speak so calmly about both the personal experiences that we've discussed and the state of Australia today. But you must be very angry, aren't you? Oh, look, Steve, I think there's two ways that you can be. You can be angry because it is an angry situation. If you think of colonisation, terra nullius, and the white Australia policies that sat in behind it, we've only been able, we've only been recognised in, in Australia as citizens for the last 53 years. Before that, we're only seen as flora and fauna. So you can focus on all the negativity or you can be part of the positives. And, you know, I've chosen to focus on the positives. I don't want to be angry. I don't want to 
Um, you know, I have a young daughter sleeping in the room next to me just here. I don't want her to be angry about our past. I want her to be proud about who she is as an Indigenous woman. I want her to be proud of her father for the way that he keeps on trying to be positive and focus on the good things in our community and being part of the good things, whether it be around education, employment, um, you know, for our people. But why is it, in your words, that New Zealand, the country not so very far from you, that you're often sort of linked with and compared with, is, in your words, light years ahead of us in Australia when it comes to the attitudes towards treatment of Indigenous people? Why? It's very simple. Um, when the English went to New Zealand, they signed a treaty with the local Indigenous people. They have sovereignty of their own country. In Australia, when the English came here and invaded us, they claimed Terra Nullius. That's the complete difference you mean, in yeah, the why New Zealand is concept. light years yeah. ahead of where we are today. Right. So, what to do about it? You, you have uh, a Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who recently claimed that there never had been slavery in Australia. Uh, he defends Captain Cook, the British settler who you are referring to when you talk about this idea of Brits landing on the empty land of Australia. Is the leadership in your country listening to you? I mean, you now run foundations, you're involved with business empowerment for Aboriginal peoples, but are the people in power listening? Um, I don't know if they're listening or not. There's other issues going on in our country that, um, that they think needs more attention. Um, you have to remember, we're 2.8% of the population here in Australia. So not much time and effort is put into, you know, working with us as Indigenous people. And when I mean working with us, that's listening to us, um, taking our advice and, and, and creating good governance and policy behind it. Um, we have some incredible Indigenous leaders now in our government parties, which is great. We need more of it. Um, for me, I will work with government. I will help them achieve their KPIs when it comes to Indigenous um, outcomes. But I don't have time to wait for them. And I don't have, uh, Indigenous people don't have time to wait for the government to get this right. So we're working with corporates here in Australia who understand it, who see the value in working with Indigenous people, um, whether it's through education, employment, um, or with philanthropic work. There's great opportunities through corporates here in Australia, and um, you know they really um, need to be acknowledged for the work that they've been able to do and in helping raise Indigenous people's lives during the last you know 20 plus years when it comes to building capability for for our people. Quick final thought, Adam. You call your film The Australian Dream. Do you believe in it, or is that ironic? Yeah, it's up to the people who watch the documentary. I think anyone who's been to Australia has a completely different view of the, our country than what I do, that's for sure, and than any Indigenous person has. But I think any person who lives in Australia and watches this documentary might change, you know, what the Australian dream means to them. You know, we have a lot of people that have come here on boats and planes who are living the Australian dream. They've escaped war, um, they've escaped, uh, escaped Great Depression, they've been pushed out of their countries by other invading countries, and they've come to Australia and they've been able to, in one or two generations, live a better life than what they did when they came here. Unfortunately for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, we're still yet to reap in the benefits that everybody else does when it, when it relates to the Australian dream. But I'm hopeful, and I think when you watch the documentary, there is that sense of hope. As you know, you hear the Indigenous voices during the documentary, we are all hopeful that we all can you know, live that Australian dream that, that um, you know, we prosper to. Adam Goods, been a pleasure to have you on Hard Talk. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it.